With that said, um, let's just go before the Lord. If you want to, we're going to continue our series in Romans chapter 5, but let's go before God. Father, we just thank you this morning, Lord, for the gift of your word. Lord, so often we can take it for granted, and so often we can just put it aside. But God, today I pray this, Lord, that it, it comes alive to each and every one of us, because your word makes it clear that it is living, it's breathing. In fact, you make it clear in your word that it gives us everything that we need to navigate through this life and to see our lives changed. And so, Father, I just pray, Lord, as we continue our series in Romans 5, that you just continue to open our hearts and minds. I pray that we are equipped, Lord, that when we leave this place, that we just don't hide what we've learned under a bushel, but we go out and we share it, and we show the love of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I just ask that you just continue, Lord, just to move amongst us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you, again, Lord, be with the children this morning as they dig into your word. Lord, I pray, Lord, that when they leave their classes this morning, that they're excited about the things of Jesus. So, Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing and what you're going to do. And, God, I also want to lift up Jeff Trott to you, Lord, I, a brother that has been away for some time. God, I pray... Lord, for him today, Lord, he's going in for a heart cath, and God, I just ask that you just go before him. Lord, I just ask that you just have your hand on him. And Father, we just thank you for everything that you've done. We praise you, and we say this, and we all pray this together. Amen. 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 Well, Romans chapter 5, last week, Pastor Ken shared, and he handled the word just in such a great way. He was faithful to the text. And I can't tell you how much that means to me as a pastor here, to have somebody come up and handle the text very well. And so I was glad to see what Ken brought off, and, and, and out of that, the, the first five verses in chapter five. And I was thinking about this. You know, this is what Ken brought out in these verses, but we're also going to see this through the next five verses that we look at today. We've seen that we have peace with God and that we're right with Him because of what Christ did for us. We also see that we have access to God. Isn't that cool to know that you have access to God? Again, there is no barrier between us and Him. Uh, we've seen also that we have a hope of the glory to come. Hope of the glory to come. Someday... We're going to be with our Lord, but we're also going to receive a glorified body. I mean, that's pretty cool. Uh, we also see that all trials and hardships are for a purpose. How many can say amen to that? You've learned that. Maybe you, in your Christian walk, you've walked that out. And, and now maybe you're in a place where when the trial comes, you realize that it, it's for your good, for your benefit. And then the, the fifth thing we've seen was that the love of God has been poured out to us. And we're going to see today where the love, or that idea of love, is used the first time in Romans up until this point. And it's going to be used many times in our study as we continue. But I just want to read through the verses, and what we're going to do is we're going to walk through those verses like we normally do. So if you open up your Bibles to Romans 5, we're going to look at verse 5. I'm going to start with 5 just to... Again, just coming to this week's text. And it says this, And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. And I love this idea, because in that verse, in verse 6, it says this, And why were we yet weak at the right time Christ died for the ungodly? If we see the Trinity all working together here, don't we? I mean, we see the mention of God the Father, we see... Mention, mention of the Holy Spirit, we see the mention of Christ. And again, we stand firm here, and like most churches, that we believe in a triune God. Again, we believe that there's three that are one, and they have distinct, different functions, that they are all about doing that they are one God. And again, we've taught that here, and sometimes that can be mind-blowing in a lot of different ways, if you think too hard about it. But we do serve a triune God. And as we continue in the text here, in verse 7, it says this, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. But God shows his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if we were the enemies, we are reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much, much now, or much more now, that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now receive reconciliation. Yeah. And these verses here are powerful. They're life-changing. I hope that we all walk out of here today with the realization what Jesus Christ has done for us. And I hope we truly see the depth of his love. You know, here next week, we're going to be selling, celebrating what the world calls Valentine's Day, right? And I'm all, listen, I'm all for taking your sweetie out for dinner. And listen, I'll probably get Missy a card and something, uh, flowers probably. And is she in here? She's in the other room, so I'm not giving this away. <laughs> Planning a nice dinner out. But, but again, how many know that our world in a lot of ways has distorted love? You know, I was thinking of a movie, and we're actually going to have a, a movie night here the last Sunday of the month during the evening. How many of you have seen the movie The Princess Bride? Come on, don't be ashamed. <laughs> Growing up in a Christian home, I can guarantee you I've seen that movie probably a hundred times. But it's been a while since I've seen it. And many of you that have seen it, what, what it's all about is it's this grandfather reading the story to his grandson. And his grandson wants a story that is full of adventure. And in the beginning, what happens is it talks about this young boy and girl, Buttercup and Wesley. And Wesley is this servant on this farm that Buttercup's parents own. And, and while they're young, in their teen years, she kind of bosses him around. And every time she bosses him around, he actually says this, as you will. Every time she tells him, sell the horse as you will. Because Wesley down deep secretly loves Buttercup. And throughout the movie, what happens is he, they find that they have a mutual affection for one another, and Wesley decides to go away because he's just a poor farmhand that he's going to go out and make his riches and come back and marry Buttercup. And when he does, and when he returns, what you'll find out as you come view the movie, and I recommend it, you're going to laugh, I don't care what age you are, how young you are, you're going to enjoy this movie. But you're going to laugh and, and have a good time, but the thing is, is this, he comes back, and he's kind of a whole different person. But one thing that has never changed is he still has a deep love for Buttercup. Right? Buttercup. Trying to keep his name straight. <laughs> and Wesley gets a point in the movie where he actually dies. You, know, you all remember that part? His friends think he's dead, and they take him to a guy named Miracle Max. You guys remember Miracle Max? Played by Billy Crystal, I think it was. And Miracle Max, or Matt, or Miracle Max, actually worked for the Kings and was fired from the Kings that position by his son, by this guy, he just can't stand. He was now trying to marry Buttercup. And there's a part in this where they bring him there, they think Wesley's dead, and Miracle Max is supposed to have the ability to bring him back to life. And Miracle Max is dealing with his friends, and he's not sure about their motives, and finally he asks him, why is he here? Is it because you, he owes you money or owes a debt to you, and you want me to bring him back to life so he can pay you? And, and Miracle Max says, I can figure this out on my own. He goes over by the fireplace. He grabs an air bellow. Remember those things that you use at a fireplace to bring oxygen in the air? In? And he pulls this thing back. He sticks it in Wesley's mouth. And he gives it two squeezes. And you see Wesley's chest go up and down, up and down. And then he says, I'll find out exactly what the motive is here. And he presses on Wesley's chest. And Wesley says, True love. <laughs> True love. And that's good for Merrick Max because that's noble. True love. And what we're going to see today is this. You know, the world has defrauded truly what true love is. I've said this before from the pulpit. Often love in the world depends on what you can do for me. Or what I can get from you. 
And how many know that love, God's perfect love, is actually a verb? It's an action word. You ladies here, maybe you've said this to your husband before. I'll tell you that I, it's been said to me before that, again, love often shows action. How many know it's just not good enough just to tell or speak to your wife about love, how you love her, but if there's no action in her, she's not going to believe you. And the thing is, is this, the pure love of God, the agape love of God is an action. And we're going to look at that action today in this text. So let's look at verse 6. Again, I'm going to reread it, and we're going to go through 8, I think, and then we're going to tackle this. It says this, For while we are yet still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners. The proof, the action in this text is Jesus died. It's evident. It's very, it jumps out at you as you read this text. And not only did he die, but he chose to die. You guys realize that they didn't put Jesus to death, right? That he chose that death. That he walked to the cross obedient without no hesitation. Again, many people will say, well, what about in the garden when he asked the Lord if this cup could pass from me? You, you all realize that the, the wrath in that cup that Jesus was talking about, it wasn't the beatings. It wasn't the mocking that he was going to face. It wasn't them pulling out his beard. It wasn't them beating them, nailing him to a cross that he was afraid of, but he was afraid of the wrath of God, the separation that he was going to have to face. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. We see that Apostle Paul uses perfect love of God, the perfect love of God here. And he also gives kind of an oxymoron here. He, he gives us a, a polar opposite here. He also brings into the sex the idea of the frail love of man. He says this here. He says in verse 7, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. What he's saying is this. He's throwing the question out there. I don't even know if somebody who died for a righteous man, and rare, very rarely will it happen even for a good, a good man. Think about that. How many of you here are willing to lay down your life for the person sitting next to you? All right, of course, there's families here, so that question, <laughs> I would believe that most of you would. I mean, I have to believe that Emily would lay down her life for any one of her children. Because I understand, I kind of know what a mother's love is like because I have one. I think about Jason, I think he would lay down his life for his family. And I, I can say this as your pastor, and I truly mean it. Uh, whether you like me or not, I would lay down my life for you. You say, what do you mean, whether you like like you or not? I, I've actually had people throughout the years of ministry say that they didn't like me. But still, God put a deep love in my heart for them. And that's that's a love that Jesus Christ showed. That's the love that God the Father showed us. Perfect love, God's perfect love gave his very best. His very best was Jesus. Man's love, or what the word here is scarily, it means this, with difficulty, with much work. So man's love, yeah, you, like the Apostle Paul says, you, maybe you'd lay down your life for uh, a righteous man, but maybe, and maybe for a good person, but yeah, man, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be much work for you to do that. And how many know that that's true? How many men here know that it's hard to die like Christ did for the church for your life? Amen? Or am I the only Amen. one? Amen. It's hard to die itself. Yeah. It's not easy. We see another word here in verse 6. It says, while we were still weak. What is that word weak there? It says, while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Now, how many here can say at one time that you were ungodly? I was. 
Before the age of 10, I was on God. I was in a deep, dark place in my life. Many of you know my testimony. I don't need to get into that this morning. If you want to know it, I can tell you afterwards. But to the point that I wanted to take my own life out of <coughs> In a dark place. That word weak there means this. To be sick. To be without strength. To be hopeless. That's what that Greek word there means. To be weak. So often we think of being weak as just, man, I've worked out today. How many know on leg day you're just dying? Right? <laughs> we went out with a couple the other night. and We were eating dinner. All of a sudden both husbands were like, oh, my leg, leg cramps. And I mean, it was like, I mean, they were about screaming, stood up, had to stretch out. It was like, wow. But this is weakness here is this. It's the idea of being sick without any strength, being hopeless, being hopeless. I don't know about you, but that's where I'd be without Christ. I would be hopeless. I would be weak. I would be without any type of strength at all. We would have no ability to help ourselves. How often do we try to help ourselves, though, don't we? We get ourselves in a difficult situation, and instead of going to God with that, often we try to fix it on our own. What happens? Oftentimes what happens is you get to the point to where you are helpless, where you have no other place to look but off. And you cry out to God. It says this in Ephesians 2, Chapter 2, verse 5, Ephesians 2, verse 5. It says, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made, uh, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. See, we were dead. It, can there be any more weakness? Before you knew Christ, the Bible tells me that you were dead. Kind of like Wesley. No life. Completely dead. Nothing living. And, you know, it was a couple of years ago, I wrote, wrote a blog. It was entitled Superheroes. How many know that our world today is infatuated with superheroes? <laughs> Would you agree? Yeah. I mean, Marvel movies, when they come out, and listen, I'm not anti-Marvel movies. So please don't you know, send me emails. Uh, and try to, Please don't try to liken them all to Jesus, though, either. Please. But... How many know, too, that our world is infatuated with zombies? <laughs> right? The big show, uh, is it uh, Walking Dead? It seems like everybody watches. And uh, we, we don't watch it, by the way. But uh, there's movies out about zombies. And there's been um, several movies that have been made out of one movie. And, and the world is just affiliated with superheroes and the dead. And I believe that that's something that's inside of them that they recognize. I need someone to save me. And I'm also walking around dead. And the thing is, is this. As born again believers, we've been given life. And we do have a superhero. His name is Jesus Christ. I think about... This phrase also we see here in verse 6. It says, for while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for us. What, is, what does that mean in the Greek? What does that mean? Again, this is why I preach verse by verse, because I think we lose too much if we, we didn't. It says, and that idea, at the right time, simply means this, at the perfect time. At the perfect time. Or, it also means, in the nick of time. What did he say in the nick of time is the perfect time? Mm -hmm. Very similar. And how many here would agree with me that the Lord saved you at the perfect time? Mm -hmm. At the perfect time. I look back at my life and I say, and I'm not just talking about my salvation. How many realize that God has saved you throughout? Not talking about your salvation, but he saved you from many things. <laughs> And he's shown up at the nick of time, even for those different things. But again, the Apostle Paul is talking here about the right time, the right time of your salvation. How many of you ever sat here before and said, man, if I only would have been saved earlier, I wouldn't have to be facing these difficulties. 
Oh, if I would have only been saved, things could have been so much different. Well, if I would have been only saved earlier, I would have had a different wife probably or a different husband. Listen, you need to stop that. Because the thing is, is this, that Jesus Christ, he did save you in the nick of time, at the right time, and for a purpose. And the thing is, is this, again, what many Christians do is they have fixed on that instead of fixing on what God has done for them, they go back in the past. And they try to orchestrate things in their mind how things could be different. But do you realize that God, up until that point of your salvation, has orchestrated everything to bring you to that point? Don't forget that. But don't camp there. Often say this, in the past, you can put tent stakes down, but don't leave your tent there. Leave a tent stake there, and you can recall that. You can use that for God's glory. You can say, look at what God has done for me, but don't allow yourself to camp there. And too many Christians do that. I think about what Galatians 4, verse 4 says. Galatians 4, verse 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law. I love that. But when the fullness, the perfect time had come, God sent a son. You know, as you read Old Testament history, and I'll say this, listen, Jesus is in the Old Testament. If you can't see him in the Old, you won't see him in the New. You guys have heard me say that many times. But he didn't appear on this earth as man and God until God's perfect timing. When the fullness came forth, when God knew exactly when this world needed him. I think about this word, ungodly. We all agree at one time we were there. It simply means wicked. Now, we don't like to hear that in churches nowadays, do we? Nobody here likes it when I get up here and say, you're all wicked. How many know that that's not a true statement if you're born again? In fact, we're going to see that the Bible says that you've been made righteous. We're going to get into that a little bit more. Now in verse 7, as we continue, it says this, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would die, even die. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners. You know, I, I think about this idea. We see here again, Apostle Paul talking about that perfect love, that perfect love. Keep that in your mind, that perfect love of God. Now what are we going to see through these next several texts here is this, is that God has not only come for the righteous, but he has come for what? Sinners. And he came for us when we were still sinners, the Bible says. You know, man's love is it would be good for a righteous person, maybe, Paul says in that text. And again, man's love is based often on attraction, on what they can get of value or worth. Men and women are inclined to love those that love them. I mean, don't you love that person that just has encouragement? I love you so much, man. You are so good. <laughs> But do we have a tough time with the person that comes up to you in love and says, man, you're in a bad spot. You're in a bad place. Boy, I don't know if you've noticed that. How many love that phrase? I don't know if you've noticed this in your life. When you start cringing, it's like, oh, what's coming? I remember when I came past or became pastor at one time I was I actually told her I was listening. It's important that I get reviewed often because I have blind spots, areas in my life that I can't see. How many know that that's true? Missy had a, a, a Chevy Equinox, and I just disliked that car so much. It was a great car, fuel efficient. It wasn't a bad ride, but it had so many blind, blind spots in it. I can't tell you how many times, even when I would turn, there was a blind spot, and how many times I had people honk at me because I almost took them out. And so often we have those blind spots and we need people in our life that are going to speak truth. That are going to be honest with us in love. 
Again, we're inclined to love those that agree with us. We're inclined to love those that uh, we appreciate. But it says this, that God, yet we, while we were yet sinners, loved us. Listen, I, I hope I say it, what I'm going to say it doesn't offend anybody here, and I don't think it's going to, but do you realize that the Lord loves the prostitute? Of course. The drug addict? That God loves everyone out there. But how many know that he hates the sin? He hates the sin. And it's no different with us. God loves us. He gave his one and only son for us. He made us righteous. And through the blood of Jesus Christ, and through the work of Christ and the Holy Spirit, I often say this, it's almost like God the Father has rose-colored glasses. Because God the Father sees you as righteous. How many know the Holy Spirit does a work in you? He points out, He convicts. He allows you to see those things that need to be changed in your life to make you more like Jesus Christ. I think of Luke 5, verse 32. Jesus said this, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, I want to I wanna look at the proof of God's love and the provision of God's love. In these next verses, we're going to see this. It says this in verse 9. Since therefore we have not been justified by his blood, or now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall be saved by his life. How many here realize what you've been saved from? I'm looking for an answer. Since we're in a small room, what have we been saved from? The wrath of God. The wrath of God. The wrath of God. We have been saved by God from God's wrath. In Romans 1.18 it says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. <laughs> suppress what truth? Who is truth? Jesus, exactly. This is something that should move each and every one of us that are born again, that have received a new spirit. This is what should move us to share the love of Christ and the hope of Christ with our loved ones. Because listen, if you don't know Christ, the word of God tells me you're under the wrath of God. There's only two camps in this world. Those that have been born again and have been made righteous through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross or those that are under the wrath of God. There is no in between. There's two camps. I think about what John 5 verse 24 says. It says, truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Now, there's a couple things I want to point out. Ken did this so well last week. Again, here at Momentum Christian Church, we teach that your salvation is eternal. Listen, I, 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 you guys, most of you know, for years I believed the opposite of that. And the reason why I did is because I was simply taught that. I grew up and I was taught that. I was told that I could lose my salvation in the morning and gain it back that night. And it wasn't until about 14 years ago where I had a good friend that said to me, why do you believe that? Is it because of what you were taught or is it what the word of God says? And he simply said to me, just read the gospel of John and see how many times that the Bible says that your salvation is everlasting. That your salvation is not dependent on you. And as I did that, it put a thankfulness in my heart. Because not only did God save me, but he was going to keep me. And in no way did it cause me to live, it did cause me to live differently. Not in a sloppy grace way where I can do whatever I want. I'm good. But what happened was this. It caused my love to grow more for God, more for Jesus Christ, to the point 
But again, as the Bible says, and as Jesus said, those that love me keep my commandments. The Bible doesn't say keep my commandments and I'll love you. And, and so what's coming out here is this idea, again, that, that eternal life is eternal. It's been given to us. But those that don't have Christ, it says this, he does not come into the judgment, the believer doesn't, but has passed from death to life. And so those that don't believe are still walking around dead in their trespasses and sin. I don't know about you, but I am so grateful that I don't have to be in charge of keeping my salvation. I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not wise enough. In John 3, John 3, verse 36, it says this. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So again, it's that idea of belief. I touched on this yesterday at Linda's funeral. Linda truly believed in Jesus Christ. She didn't see Jesus Christ as a crutch. How many of you have ever had somebody say that to you? Oh, God's a crutch to you. You know, I see a crutch over there right there. A crutch is that thing that keeps us to be able to stabilize, but we lean on that crutch, we get around on that crutch. But how many know that God's a gurney? If he's a gurney, I can't even navigate without him. I can't do nothing without him. And so whenever I've had that said to me, well, you use God as a crutch, I say, oh, no. He's much more than that. And it's what Paul brings out here is as far as this word belief that we've seen means to lean fully on, to put your full weight upon. That's who our God is. But again, those that don't know him are under the wrath of God, and it should move us to share the hope of Jesus Christ. I'm so grateful that he has given us the provision to keep us. In verse 10 it says this, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by death of the Son, much more now than we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. How many of you know that God always starts, or finishes what he starts? You know, he always does. You know, I, I, I think I'm almost completed on every project at our house that I've started. There's one project I have left in our house. We turned one of our rooms into a nursery for our granddaughter. And I redid the floor in there and did some other stuff to the walls and painted some trim. And, and, and the only thing I didn't put down was the toe kick molding. I go into that room and it's probably been about four weeks and I, Part of it was I didn't have my Yukon to be able to put full lengths of molding in. And you know, I had that, that rental car, that real little one, and it's like, I can only put like four foot pieces of molding in there. That, how many know that won't look good? <laughs> so I put it off and put it off, and then a couple of times I said, oh, it's just too cold to run out to Home Depot. And it's, it's been nagging on me every time I go by that room because it's a room at the end of our house and when we go to let the dog out, we have to walk by that room and you just glance in it and then we got our, our laundry room there and the back door mud room and, and we let the dog out from that back door. And it's just been nagging on me lately. Like I just I look in that room, it's like, oh, I've got to get the toe kick on. How many know that our God, he finishes what he starts? The Bible says, he who began a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Until Jesus Christ returns, he's going to finish what he started. How many you know that God's word also says that he's the author and the finisher of your faith? God started your book. How many of you have ever read a book that an author started but never finished? Wouldn't that be a bummer? Now, I have gotten books before to where pages were tore out. Anybody been there with me? Remember when they used to have libraries? Do they still have libraries? I think they do, right? Yeah. You go in the library with your library card. I remember I remember getting my first library card in Fairhaven. I went to the Fairhaven Library. 
And they just, I mean, I was just a small kid. It was just this little card that you kept in this little manila folder that you put in your pocket. And you didn't want to lose it because the librarian, when we went down there, not only did you get books, but she gave you a lollipop, too. And so I remember going down there and just seeing the vast books. And there was these movie projector things that you could click and watch whatever you want. But those had to stay at the library. But I can tell you this, as a little kid, I'd once in a while check out a book, and I'd get home so excited, and I'd sit down and start reading it, and some of the pages would be gone. <laughs> be completely missing, or it would be really brutal when the end would come, and there would be no more pages. But how many know that God is not that type of God? <laughs> he has started a work in your life, and he will finish it, even though it seems at times that not going anywhere. And maybe it's not going at your speed and the speed that you want. But God is faithful. It says this in Philippians 1 6. And I'm sure of this that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I think about verse 11 here in our text. It says, More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. That idea of reckon, being reconciled. Anybody here know what that means, to be reconciled? Ken? Walk after you. Yeah, yeah. To be recognized, to be, it, it's not the idea of reconditioned, but to be made new. To be reconciled, to be, have nothing between you and God. And I think about that idea. That happened at the day of your salvation. How many know, though, you look at your own life and say, man, I'm still a mess, I'm still a wreck. <laughs> but through the work of Jesus Christ, you have been made new. Again, so often, and again, that might blow your mind. Anybody else here struggle like me? Mm -hmm. Have different things that come against you? And you say, man, God, it seems like I failed you again. I think about that verse. But his mercies are new every morning. His mercies are new every morning. I think about our God who, again, has given us perfect love through his son, Jesus Christ. And how many know that perfect love gives? It's action. God so loved the world that he gave. Perfect love gives. True love gives. Husband and wife, ask yourself this, are you giving? Listen, I, I've, for years, have done marriage counseling. And what usually happens in a relationship is when one spouse stops giving, or both spouses stop giving. And it doesn't matter what it is in that relationship. If you stop giving, that's where it seems like things start falling apart. True love gives. God gave his one and only son. And then I think about this. So we've been reconciled. And, and how many know here that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation? Right? Anybody aware of that? We're going to look at a scripture here in 2 Corinthians. In fact, we're going to read a little portion because I think we need to, to be able to understand what Paul is saying here. 2 Corinthians 5, we're going to look at verses verse 11 through 21. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11 through 21. It says this, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord will persuade others, but what we are is known to God, and I hope it's known also to your conscience. We are not condemning ourselves to you again, but giving you the cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearances and not about what is in the heart. For if we are besides ourselves, it is for God. If we are in right, if we are in our right mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this: that one has died for us all. Therefore, all have died, and He died for all of us, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for Him, for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him 
thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is fast away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This ministry of reconciliation, nobody in this room can escape. Every one of us has been reconciled to God, and we've been given this ministry of reconciliation. What is the ministry of reconciliation? The Apostle Paul brought it out very clear. It's for us to share with others what Christ has done for us. We were once wicked, but now we're godly. We were once evil, but now we're righteous. We were once enemies of God, but now we're sons and daughters of God. It's sharing that hope of Jesus Christ. Now again, understanding that we don't do the reconciling. The ministry is for us to simply share that with others. You know, I would encourage the church to ask yourself this question. When was the last time you shared your faith with somebody? I ask myself this question all the time. I say, well, Pastor Dave, every Sunday, every Wednesday, you do that. And I was like, no, I'm not talking about that. You guys are all believers. I'm simply equipping you and believe at times discipling you. I have to be sharing my faith. I have to be active in the ministry of reconciliation. I have to be sharing the hope that I have in Jesus Christ. And we are living in a time like no other time. Listen, there is people searching. There are people that have no hope. Whether they have their hope in political parties, whether they have their hope in a system, listen, how many realize that that's all going to crumble and not go the way that we think it should go? And this is a problem, an issue in the church as a whole. I mean, Many of you have seen, and remember what happened to Rabbi Zacharias? There was people losing their faith over that. And it just showed me that they were placing their trust in a man more than they were God. And listen, I, I'm not ever going to let you do that to me. I have people at times say, you're a good man. I say, no, I'm not. I'm looking good to me as Jesus Christ, because you would not like me. I didn't have Christ. They'll say, oh, but pastor, you're, you're a righteous person. I always love it. Please, listen, if you need prayer, I want to pray with you. I'll pray with you most of the time right there because I have a tendency sometimes to forget and I don't want to be a liar and say, yeah, I'm going to pray for you and don't. So don't, you know, I hope that doesn't scare you off, okay? And you say, oh man, you can pray for me right there. But, but I, I always... Years ago, I used to have people come to me and say, I need your prayers, Pastor. You have to pray for me, Pastor. Your prayers are powerful. You have a connection. And I look at them and say, hmm, are you born again? Have you been made righteous? Because the Bible says a righteous man prays they don't much. And when I say man, I mean women also. Your prayers of they don't much. In the beginning of my message, I said this, that we had an unblocked ability to our God. Do we truly believe that? Do we truly believe that we've been reconciled? Because if we do, we would share the message of reconciliation. We would share the message of hope. We would share love. Listen, and listen, it, it, it's important. There's a phrase that came out, and I forget who it was, maybe Mother Teresa, who says that people should see the gospel even if they never preach the word or preach a word. Anybody know what I'm talking about, that quote? It's coming to me right now. Ken, do you know who it's from? I think it was um, Francis Assisi. Yes, yes. 
And what was the quote? Do you have the quote down? Preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Yes, yes. And, and listen, that's important that we're living the life of Jesus Christ. And that people should notice. You know what the one thing that they should notice the most of in you as a believer? I want to take us all back when Jesus came back or came to this earth. Who did he come before? Who did he first show and appear to? Shepherds, right? And what did the angels tell the shepherds? Great tidings of what? Joy. Rejoice. This is going to be joyful. One thing I noticed, and I could, and again, I should just come to me. I don't have this in my notes. I wish I would, because I can show you scriptures to back this up. In the believer's life, how many remember the day that you were born again? Wasn't there a joy? Wasn't there a weight lifted? Didn't you feel like you were walking like a foot above the ground? It was like, man, I'm no longer guilty. I've been made righteous. I've been made new. All those old things have passed away. Number one mark of a believer should be joy. But you know what? I see a lot of Christians that are just so down in the dump. Walk around like Eeyore the donkey. <laughs> yeah, I'm saved. <laughs> and I know that Jesus loves me. We should be those that are recognizable by our joy and our love. Why should we be joyful? Because we've been saved from God's wrath. What should drive us to share Christ with others? It's simply this, that they're under the wrath of God. So, with closing today, there's a couple things that I want us just to recognize here in this text. And, and one of the things is this, is that the provision of God's love has been given to us through Jesus Christ, God's Son. That has been given to us. That we also, that God always finishes what he starts. What he starts. He always finishes it. He, he is faithful, even when we're not. And then I think the next thing that's important to realize is that we've been given this ministry of reconciliation. Sharing the hope of Jesus Christ. Reaching out to those that are lost. Being very uh, to the forefront. So I'm just going to be honest. I remember reading a book years ago, Walk Across the Room. Anybody remember that book? Walk Across the Room. It was by a guy named Bill Hybels, who no longer is pastoring. And that whole book, when I read it, I threw it in the garbage about halfway through. Because it was the whole idea of we have to build relationship with those around us before we can share Christ. And in that book, they even said, sometimes that might take up to six months to three years. And you know what? I don't see that in the New Testament. I don't see that with the Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. I didn't see, I didn't see Philip say, hey, let's go to the coffee shop get some coffee. Listen, God might, again, how many know that God wants us to be in a relationship, but he wants us to preach the hope of Christ. I remember another incident in the ministry where somebody called me up to the hospital because their friend was on their deathbed. And I went up there and this person left the room. I talked to the person because it was it was go time. It seems like what I mean by go time is it's being very straight with them as a pastor, not knowing them. I mean, I come right out and say, are you right with God? Are you right with Jesus Christ? Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? I mean, in those type of situations, you don't sit around and say, hey, how's your golf game? <laughs> no, this person is dying. And you ask for the boldness and the courage and the Holy Spirit to, again, do what he does and recall what you need to say at your time of need. 
And as I asked this person this question, they looked at me and they said, I've been saved for 10 years. I said, you've been born again? Oh yeah, I've been born again. And I remember I left that room and I actually grabbed that guy and said, hey, your friend's been saved for 10 years. And you've been saved and you didn't know this? You did these things together, but you never brought up Christ. You never prayed at a meal. You never did this or that. You never opened your mouth about God. Listen, folks, if you live that way, what's going to happen is this. You will be a Christian to the world. You'll walk around thinking that everything is gloom and doom. Think about this. When is the most powerful time that you are just alive in Christ? It's usually when God uses you to lead someone else to Christ. When God uses you to disciple someone when God uses you to extend the love of Jesus to others. I mean, I get so excited when somebody gives their life to Christ. Often when I meet with you, if, if you're a new person and we go out to dinner, one of my first questions for you, so be prepped for it, and I simply say, hey, Tyler, what did you tell me about when you got saved? Bill, tell me when you got saved. Want to know when you get saved, and then usually I share with you about the most important point in my life. Let's stand this morning. I'm going to ask Jason to come forward. He's going to serve communion.